<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Athel Gao, and I'd like to welcome you to our session this afternoon, How Can We Make Parks More Accessible? And our speaker is Dr. Tilak Dutta. Uh, Dr. Dutta is a scientist at Kite Research, at the Kite Research Institute, the research arm of the Toronto Rehabilit Rehabilitation Institute, University Health Network, and holds cross appointments at the University of Toronto at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering and Re Rehabilitation Sciences Institute. The goal of Dr. Duda's uh, engineering health team is to give individuals with disabilities and their caregivers the tools they need to realize their full potential. His team's ongoing projects include preventing falls on icy surfaces with advanced winter footwear, preventing uh, pressure injuries from bedbound individuals at home using repositioning prompting systems, and improving the accessibility of Canada's national parks, which he's going to talk about today. So welcome, Dr. Duda. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Well, yeah, so we're here to answer this question, how can we make parks more accessible? Um, and it's an exciting time for those of us who are interested in accessibility generally in Canada with the passing of the Accessible Canada Act in 2019. There are groups all over the country that are working towards making new standards for the country. Um, and our job, uh, we were funded by Accessibility Standards Canada to make recommendations to make parks more accessible. And uh, the idea is that the work that we do, the results that we gather, will go into the outdoor spaces uh, technical standard to make these spaces more accessible. Um, our work is, we have a, a, a little less than a year now left in our work. Uh, we'll be completing in March of 2024. The you know, I think if I, well, maybe I should ask, I think it's a biased group because you came to this presentation after looking at the title, but how many people enjoy being out in nature? Most people, yeah. And we know that there is, there are lots of excellent health benefits of being out in nature. This is Mayan Ziv, many of you may know her. She was our, uh, one of our keynote speakers at our conference we held last year. I'll just let her summarize uh, why this work is so important. The outdoors are, are places that can support us physically and mentally. They can give us a sense of space and in many ways can be an awe-inspiring equalizer. The problem is that people with disabilities don't get access to a lot of those benefits because of a lack of accessibility. Uh, one of the problems, for instance, at our conference, Lucy Diaz, she's 15, by the way, she highlighted the problem with washrooms. The lack of truly accessible washrooms in parks prevents my family and so many others from enjoying the beauty our country has to offer. Thousands of people cannot go to parks because they cannot do basic bodily functions. That being said, let's get into exactly what is wrong with these washrooms. And the image on the slide is of Marine Lake and Banff National Park. Next slide. There are many barriers in washrooms, but the four biggest ones that I have personally seen are information, space, doors and paths, and equipment. Next slide. Let's start with information. Before going anywhere with my little sister, we must research that place extensively. However, usually there is barely any information available. And not only is there little information, but it's hard to find. I found that usually sites mention that there is a, wa a washroom, but never specify. Is the path to the washroom paved? Is it inclined? How wide are the doors? What's the turning space? This information is needed to know if the park is actually accessible for my sister. What might be accessible for one person may not be accessible for another. There is an image on the slide showing a screenshot from the accessibility page of Revelstoke National Park. All it says is washrooms without any specifications. So one thing she said there, accessibility means different things to different people. That's one of the themes that we're realizing. I mean, we, we knew this when we started out. How do we deal with that breadth of things? If you think about a national park, an outdoor space, how, can you, how do we organize this task of trying to make an outdoor space like that accessible? Our approach is to create what we're calling the accessibility matrix, where we think about the different activities that people may want to participate in. And so we put that across the top of the table. In this case, you might think of things like hiking or camping, um, but also things like toileting for, for Lucy's sister. That's one of the biggest barriers for them to be able to go to a park in the first place. So things like changing and toileting might go on this table. And then we think about 
what are the different needs that different people have? What does, what does accessibility mean to those different people? Someone with a mobility related disability or a vision disability or hearing. Um, the more we thought about this, we realized this is, you know, there's many other categories going down this way as well that we need to think about. Um, but the idea is that this table gives us an opportunity to organize uh, our thoughts around what are all the different things that we need to think about? Where are all the barriers? Someone with a vision impairment might need something to help them independently move around a park on a hiking trail. Um, someone, you know, thinking about ways that we can uh, use different sensory experiences to enhance what normally is considered a visual, you know, if you go to a lookout, um, what does a person with a vision related disability do at a lookout, we can make that experience more meaningful for them if we have other sensory experiences there, getting wheeled mobility devices on and off of a beach, getting in and out of the water, there are all of these solutions. Um, giving people information. Lucy talked a little bit about just even having going on the website and figuring out what you can expect when you get there is one of the biggest things we can do at the trailhead. If someone's interested in hiking, giving does giving people more specific information about the surface of the trail and the slope and the, the cross slope and the running slope and the width, does that help people be able to decide whether or not that trail might be appropriate for them. These are the kinds of questions we're trying to get at. Uh, for someone like Lucy, um, in, the, in Europe, they have a new standard, which is called the Changing Places Standard, where bathrooms now have a lift and a adult size change table to help people that need changing in those spaces and enough room for a attendant to be in there with the individual. That's going to become the new standard that we're pushing for in Canada now here too. So, you know, we've as we've gone through this process, we've been expanding, thinking about people who are neurodivergent, um, cognitive impairment. Um, you know, with COVID, it occurred to us that all of a sudden now, do we think also about people who might have a compromised immune system and what sort of needs they may have if they're going into one of these spaces with other people that might or might not have COVID? Do we need to think about that as a need um, on, this, on this matrix? So my goal here really is to, is to present to you what we've done so far. And we have four big activities that we've been trying to use to collect data to fill in this table. Um, and I'm going to try to explain that to you briefly, and then I want to leave lots of time to get your feedback, questions, discussion, tell me where we've gotten this wrong, what we're missing. I'd love to hear from you on this. So this accessibility matrix, as I said, there's kind of four ways that we're feeding information in. We're doing park visits, we're doing surveys and focus groups. Um, you, you saw some uh, footage from one of our conferences. We're running another conference this year. If you haven't grabbed one, you can grab one of the postcards there that gives you information about how you can attend. It's a virtual conference. Anyone can attend from anywhere for free. Um, and we're doing some scoping reviews. So we can go through those quickly now. Uh, the survey we ran from 2021 to 2022, we did it in English and French. There were two surveys, one for people with disabilities and one for caregivers. And we wanted to basically get people to tell us about a, a trip that they'd taken to a park in the last three years and what, what worked well, what didn't work well, essentially. We call them barriers and facilitators in our world, but really what are the pros and cons? What are the challenges? And what are the things that people came across that said, hey, this worked really well. We wanna see that replicated in other places. Um, and we kind of went through, this is what the Parks Canada uses a park visit life cycle as the way of conceptualizing when you when someone's thinking about going to a park, there's these four stages and we kind of covered off all four of those stages. We had questions that tried to address all four of those stages. Um, we got about 750 responses altogether, 375 from people with disabilities. Um, and here they just described whether they had a singular disability, complex disability, and what those disabilities were um, spread out. Um, we also got around 370 responses from caregivers and about one in five of them reported having a disability uh, or multiple disabilities as well. And their, uh, their spread of, of disability types um, includes, you'll notice mental health as one of the top ones, um, which is not surprising considering, uh, considering the challenges that caregivers often have in these kind of 
roles um, becoming overwhelmed with their care duties. Um, we asked people what what did they do for planning trips, um, and you know how did they feel dis disadvantaged by some of the tools that they used. Um, one of the things we that I I found particularly interesting was someone commented that the speed with which you need to book things, I, and I remember doing this, if there's a key campsite that you want to book for a weekend or for a week or something, there's a certain date at which they release the next batch of bookings. And I remember setting an alarm to, to go on the computer or getting on the phone, and you try to quickly get in there and book the site. Well, there's people who that just doesn't work for. And so we're really disadvantaging some people in those in those ways. Um, where did people go for their trip planning? You know, we got a, a range of of um, places that you might expect, social media, um, access now. So Maya and Ziv, who you saw speak, uh, who's our keynote speaker at our conference, that's her uh, organization. Um, and they go around and create rating systems for different parks and trails and, and spaces. And uh, so there's, there's an interesting range of places where our respondents, um, the, the different tools they used, what were the biggest obstacles that they reported? I mean, none of these are particularly surprising, but what we were particularly interested in is making sure we're not missing anything in our in our table as we're thinking about what the barriers of facilitators are, access to information, costs, lack of accessible transportation are some of the most common issues. And you can see um, the difference between what caregivers answered and and what people with disabilities answered in their in their responses. Um, yeah, things and and what were obstacles, incorrect information, um, issues with bus stops and parking, things like that were commonly uh, re reported. Um, sorry, this text got a little small here. The what were all of the activities? You know, as we're thinking about what are the things across the top that we want to make sure we're capturing? What are all the different activities that we want to make sure we're listing? Um, here's the here's the list that we got back from what are all the activities that people liked or wanted to participate in these are the things that you know it's not just about physically I think a lot of times accessibility is interpreted to mean that you can physically get yourself into that space but once you're physically there are you able to do the thing you want to do with the people that you want to do them with that was one of the the key things that came through in many of our in many of our responses is people go to these places to do things together with their family with their friends so saying that there is an accessible trail may not be uh, an appropriate um it may not be the best response if not everyone wants to do that trail the accessible trail should be the trail that everyone wants to do it's not a extra short trail it's not just the uh, visitor center that they can get to but not any of the the trails behind the visitor center people want to do things together i think that's one of the key takeaways um yeah but you can see the list of activities there uh, one of the one of the things that that kept recurring to was about the information that people were provided Someone looks up on online or they call to confirm what they looked up online or they ask a person at the front desk. Those three things often don't, don't line up. The information they get in one place, the person they talk to when they get there is unaware of what they what's written on the website or vice versa. Um, or people simply give incorrect information or don't understand what that particular person's accessibility need is and can't properly provide them uh, advice on what they should do when they're there. Um, here's one person uh, who really liked particular trails being longer accessible trails i think there's uh, there some of the responses we've gotten have described how the accessible piece of a park if there is one is often a very simple um, short experience it's not as it's it's often not the most interesting it's often um kind of bland in terms of what you see and what you experience and so i think that's one of the things that this person uh responded that particularly at annette lake they wish there were more accessible long trails that were properly graded for them um, another person and this is something that came up a few times uh with asl 
people that use ASL, there's an assumption, I think, that if you have a hearing related disability, you should be able to read captions or if there's text or signage that you can read if you can if you can interpret ASL that you have the ability to read. But in fact, uh, some ASL users, it's like their only language. And so providing so this is something that I think, you know, it's, it's there's a lack of awareness around what um, what someone with a hearing impairment might need. Um, Moving on to the scoping reviews, we did an academic scoping review. We started with uh, 3,200 papers and ended up with about 44. Mark Wheeler, who's doing a presentation tomorrow, I think here, um, uh, is leading that work, and we're gonna we're we're still in the in the phase of writing up the final results of that work. The one interesting finding from that is the papers. When we look at the dates of publication, we see a very fast rise in the interest in this area, which is which is quite exciting. It sounds like there's, for whatever reason, it may be partly to do with uh, more countries like Canada passing accessible uh, accessibility um, laws and things and legislation. But it does seem like there's a there's a spike happening right now. Um, as we were doing this scoping review, this literature review, the, the traditional uh, review, we started doing just kind of Google searches to learn more about what keywords we should be using and what sort of topics we should be digging into. And we kept finding this rich body of videos on YouTube. People like, this is Kevin and Dee, they're an interabled couple. I think their YouTube channel is called Accessible Adventurers. And they travel around um, and much of what they do is kind of review parks. Thanks. Roots are always my nemesis. Do you have any suggestions of what to do for roots on the trail? You don't want to ruin nature, but um, that's the barrier. Go the rest of the way. So these gates here are Kevin's nemesis. They often block the whole trail without leaving space. But look at that! Not this top. So you can see there. there there's other videos. This is. Uh, I think she's. She. Her channel is called the Access or the Accessible Photographer, something like that or the disabled photographer, sorry, I'm forgetting her name exactly, but she travels around and looks at accessibility features, I think in South America. This is a video where they show the use of, a, of something called the talking pen, where their signage actually has a little area on it where if, you if you're carrying this pen and you tap it, it has, the, the pen has a speaker in it and, it and it reads you or gives you information about what's in the sign. And so people, if they want when the visitors to this site, um, can sign out this, this device and, and walk around with it. Um, other videos, another type of video that we found was uh, conferences that have been recorded or webinars. This is a Euro Park webinar from a couple of years ago where they had a number of people describe what accessible nature means to them. So kind of a European um, perspective. I think nature doesn't need to offer two easy solutions. I, I like challenge myself and uh, I like the fact that when you go to the nature, you never know what is going to happen there. And uh, it, it's a big part of it. So that, that's she's just saying, I don't want things to be too easy. I like the challenge. I like feeling like I can manage in an unpredictable environment. So we, as we started coming across these videos, it came up, it, it occurred to us, like, should we be thinking about doing some kind of scoping review of this resource of these these videos so we kind of came up with our own methodology sort of parallel to what an academic scoping review is we found 19,000 videos doing um we, we had to learn how to use the google api or the the youtube api uh to find this this number of videos but then we went through kind of a uh, a similar process to what you would go through for a scoping review where instead of a title and abstract screening we kind of did a title and description screening and then a full video screening and then we ended up with a, a list of 308 uh, YouTube videos and if you're interested you can go see these at uh, at our website engineeringhealth.ca YouTube and you'll see all 308 videos there um, and we're going through and kind of consolidating all the key facilitators and barrier information from those videos um, but what's really interesting you know as we were going through this what what it what we realized is 
it, this, these, these resources are really valuable for taking that information and maybe making like a compilation of little clips to quickly get people up to speed. You know, if you want Parks Canada staff, the frontline staff who, um, you know, has a general lack of awareness in, in our experience of what different accessibility needs are, someone could quickly take these videos and put them together into something that could quickly become a training video or something. Watch this 20 minute video and you'll get a sense of a wide range of people's needs um, and what they what barriers they experience when going to certain parks. Um, we also did park visits, as I mentioned. Um, I had the opportunity to go to George and Bay Island National Park, and this was supported with Access Now. We, we hired them to help us organize this trip, and we wanted to make sure we were, we were seeing the park, um, we were evaluating it appropriately. So they've developed their own kind of evaluation methodology. Um, Rick Hansen also has a, um, their, their kind of accessibility evaluation uh, certification. And we wanted to see whether one or both of those are appropriate for this type of evaluation for outdoor spaces and, and, and whether we could suggest improvements to how we do these kind of um, evaluations. So, so that was kind of the goal here was to assess the assessment method really. Um, so the Georgian Bay Island Park, the first thing we did is look online before we went to see what are their accessibility features. And then we kind of compared what we saw when we got there. So you'll notice it says offers full access to Beausoleil Island, uh, wheelchair accessible dock, washroom showers, camping. So in this, this park, actually, you have to take a ferry to get there. So you have to actually wait for a ferry. The ferry takes you over and, um, and uh, this is now on the island. Um, and so you can see the group I was with, there was a, a power wheelchair user and a walker user. We also had another person who was neurodivergent on, in the group. Um, and we learned quite a lot. We learned a ton. I can just touch on a couple of things quickly here today on what I picked up. Um, I'm not sure what they describe as a wheelchair accessible dock. We got on this boat from this dock which was not how our wheelchair user friend got on the dock. This was the approach we had to take to get him on. It took three of us to basically get him up onto that ramp. And he was, he was comfortable with that approach, but I'm not sure every wheelchair user would be. Um, it could be that this is the dock they're talking about at the other end. So when you get to the ferry, so this is what they call Toby Dock. That's what that looks like. And I'm still not sure if I would call that a wheel wheelchair accessible dock. Um, there's also uh, the other thing we obviously wanted to check out was the bathrooms because it's always an issue. So there's three accessible bathrooms listed on the, the map that we're given. And this is still, this is, I pulled this off their website two days ago. So this is still what it looks like. Um, and this is the, so this is the visitor center here where we were, we were spending most of our time kind of hanging out around the beach area. And there should be an accessible bathroom there, but it appears that it, it, it says staff only. I don't know if you can read that. It says staff only. I think there was at one time an accessible bathroom there, which no longer is there. So this actually caused a bit of an issue for us. One of the people in our group needed to use the bathroom before catching the ferry to go back, uh, to, go back uh, to the mainland. And so we were kind of hanging out in this area and we said, oh, it looks like there should be a bathroom right there. We'll just hit the bathroom before we go to catch the ferry. We'll just leave ourselves an extra five minutes. Well, it turns out that that bathroom wasn't there. So now the options became going to this one or that one. Um, and the both of the people that that were our um, uh, people with disabilities decided it wasn't worth the risk of missing the last ferry of the day and so they basically said i'll just be uncomfortable until we get back so um you know it, th these little things make a big difference i think in a person's uh exp overall experience it's such a simple thing to fix but these kinds of things keep coming up over and over and and it and going on any of these um you know, going and seeing this in person, it, it, it's a little shocking how simple it would be to make these experiences better. 
So the last thing I'll mention is our conference that you already saw a couple of clips from. You can go to engineeringhealth.ca PAC 2022, and you can see the full conference there. Um, you can see full recordings. Um, we had a, an amazing lineup of people. We had 30 different speakers. Um, Megan Deal spoke about bathrooms and, and similar to uh, Lucy that you saw earlier. Uh, Noah is from Iqaluit and for him, he, he happens to be blind. For him, the biggest issue of going outdoors in nature is polar bears and safety around polar bears. And so, their need, so his discussion was around um, ensuring that there's some central place that he can call in before he goes for his hike to ask about whether there were any polar bear sightings. Uh, Leah delivered her talk in ASL and talked about how um, for her it is, a lang it is a language just like English and French is a language and she's pushing to have ASL recognized in that way. Um, many of you may know Mahadeo. I believe he has another talk right now in one of the adjacent rooms perhaps. Um, he did a great talk about just helping people understand the differences between accessibility, inclusion, usability, these concepts that we kind of use interchangeably, but if you dig down into them, there's actually, uh, it's worth thinking about them a little more deeply. And I was very happy to see Parks Canada, Mary Helen, who's the acting uh, director of, of um, a visitor experience, join us. Uh, I have to tell you that Parks Canada, of all the people that we, when we were doing this project, they have been the least supportive, but they came um, and they, they invited after she came and delivered her talk and I got to listen to some of the other talks, she all of a sudden said, oh, I see what they're doing here. I need to tell all of my staff to come for the next two days. So she was on the first day and we had uh, quite a few Parks Canada people join us for the remaining time. I consider that a huge win. Um, and and I'm, I'm thinking it may actually start to make a difference. We've been talking with them on more friendly terms uh, since the conference and they're coming back for next year's conference again. So uh, we, just as an aside, when we said we were going to do a bilingual accessible conference virtually, um, we expected there to be some platform that could handle ASL, LSQ, captioning in English and French, uh, audio interpretation in English and French, um, but there is not. So we basically had to build our own system to do it. Uh, and the instructions are here using Zoom. We, we, we wrote it up because we felt other people surely need to know how to do this in, at some point in the future. Uh, every, all, by the way, there are lots of companies that will tell you they can do this, but when it comes right down to it, they won't be able to do it. Um, so we're running, because this went so well, we had 600 registrants. Uh, we're running it again uh, this summer. I think you all have a postcard or grab one. If you don't, you can register. It's free. We're expecting to have another great group of speakers for that. And this is our team. That's, that's a fantastic team putting this all together. And I'll end with uh, Maya and just closing uh, with uh, some closing remarks. Because who has access to the outdoors? Who has the privilege or the accessibility or the sense of invitation and belonging to be included in the outdoors? Everyone should. So um, I'm open, the floor is open for discussion. This is my email address, that's our website. Feel free to send me any thoughts or comments, anything we should be doing differently, um, anything else we need to pay attention to, I'd love to uh, love to hear from you. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. We, I've heard the same concerns around National Historic Sites, which are related, right? Whenever you want to make it, make those spaces more accessible, people say, well, you can't touch the building. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, you're absolutely right. We need to come up with strategies for addressing that point, coming up with persuasive arguments, I think, right at the end of the day. Um, yeah, I, any, if anyone else has suggestions, yeah. Well, I'm going to suggest a microphone. Actually, if you wouldn't mind just repeating the question. Oh, absolutely. So, I'm wondering, are there examples of people from uh, parks that are doing a good job of trying to strike that balance between accessibility and, and natural and spoiled and accessibility plus a little bit of risk to the way that person is describing? 
Yeah, I think, it, so the question was, are there positive examples of places that are doing this balance well, the keeping nature intact, why, you know, not damaging nature while also providing accessibility. Um, to be honest, I feel like the what accessibility is, it's inter how it's interpreted is in its infancy. We do I don't think, you know, when I say the word, you say the word, I think different people have different interpretations of what that means. And I don't, e so I don't know to say they're doing it well. I don't even know what we're talking about yet. Like, are we talking about wheelchairs able to go down a path, get into a building, get into the bathroom? Someone like Lucy's sister is able to go to that space, um, you know, where there's a lift and a change table, like, you know, to her, it's it's such a messy concept still. Um, certainly, I think there are award-winning trails that are uh, valued because they're accessible to everyone and more people, you know, it's, it's somewhere everyone can go together. There's definitely lots of examples like that. And that might be one of the strategies to take to, to demonstrate why this is a value, I guess, for, um, yeah, in, in that fight. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. I'm looking up your website. Great website. It doesn't tell you where the conference is. It's virtual. So we felt like for accessible for to make it accessible, we uh, it was we were originally going to do it as in person. We had COVID happen, and I and the more we thought about it, we said this is we had speakers from all across Canada join us, and it was um, you know I think we're all tired of virtual stuff, but I will tell you the feedback we got was glowing from people that came to this conference, and it was. Uh, despite it being virtual, you know, there are pros and cons, and I think it, it worked for us. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Do you, do you want, I can, I think I can give you this one. Let's see, how does this work? Uh, if I keep going, right, I shouldn't keep going. That's, That's good. good. Um, yeah, just, yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, there we go. All right, uh, it was too difficult. I don't want to talk now. Um, so anyway, I was just a moment ago for the folks that uh, depend on the, captioning i was just remarking uh, what a really great start on getting statistics uh, both qualitative and quantitative um so a good job it reminds me of a project we did on an entirely different subject and it's excellent to get that uh, kind of data to work from especially engaging stakeholders um the other comment was something about the people getting worried about what you're going to do to their park we had uh, folks and i was actually uh, a part of out of an accessibility advisory group, uh, the Rouge, I think it's a national city park, it's called, or something like that. Yes. Rouge and in, in um, ur urban, thank you. Um, and um, they were really thinking through serious stuff uh, and really improving <laughs> the park and the process, decreasing traffic and you know uh, cars leaking everywhere and that. Uh, and it was the neighbors that gave the biggest flack yeah. on it, not. I don't know anybody loved the park we're complaining about. Um, and the last thing, uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> the, la the, the last thing um, was you had a, a, a the dock showing, and that is a common problem. This is a technical note because the 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 way the water raise, rises and lowers here, especially in in Ontario. Um, there can be huge differences and the ramp going up, you may be going down in the beginning of the season. Um, and that having to have a plate that rub, that's the challenge every, anywhere you go in water-based places, that's a trick. Um, you need a lot of room. Um, and then it, there could be another, a metal plate that, that pivots exactly at the end, which I don't think that had. But even that, I'm, um, 
So that was a kind of a ramp that slides back and forth, you know, and increases. So the, 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 that pivot plate would be very good there. Yeah, I've uh, done a couple of yacht clubs, Lake Ontario, and uh, that's just, you know, in Lake Ontario, well, like the height of this room in one month, sometimes difference, mm -hmm. right? It seems that way when you're trying to sail. So uh, yeah, that's a, that's a big challenge for, and having the length you need, so. Four more points. I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just to add to the gentleman's NIMBY comments, for those of you NIMBY, not in my backyard, um, I lived in Jarvis. You've all heard of Port Dover where the bikers go on Friday the 13th. Well, for 30 years, I lived 10 miles from there. And they've got a beautiful beach. And a number of years ago, uh, the local Lions Club purchased, like the, the, one of the main drags goes right down to the public beach. And they, they had constructed and purchased a roll up wooden sidewalk that was going to go from the end, from the paved portion out to the water. So somebody in a wheelchair could get to the water and go in the water. And the griping and the grousing you heard mostly from the locals oh you're going to spoil the beach you know one counselor said the disabled don't need to put their own personal sidewalk they can go up to the uh, 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 you know pier and sit and look at the water well i wrote a very long letter to the editor to the local newspaper and you know chided him for his very narrow-minded views you know and th and this is the big thing you know oh you don't want to destroy the park oh you can't touch you can't touch the building oh you know like you know like until you're you know until you've got problems you know disabilities yourself you don't know like when somebody pats me on the back and says oh i know how you feel oh yeah 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 30 years of chronic pain yeah 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 you know how i feel like i say getting past the stupidity of man for lack of a better phrase that's the key, and I think you've done a good start here. Like the Parks Canada lady, like uh, you know, she had you know, like she thought she was going to be under attack. I think there, and she had the epiphany uh, part way through, like, oh, geez, this is good. And then she was able to get everybody else. And I think you know, and that's a testament to the message you're doing. And about virtual, after three years in and three years of virtual meetings, I want to go out. <laughs> but thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great comments. Yes. So you can, yeah. Thanks. So I guess I'm bouncing around on some of the points that have already been made well about the uh, the, intru the intrusion or the ruining of nature. It's a bit much. Um, and and as as you said, there are other ways, you know, there's mats that keep growth from coming up and um, there's, you know, boardwalks are great and they're natural material. Um, but well, there's two things I want before I forget is I did like that there was a point made of I don't necessarily want everything to be easy. There's a lot of people with disabilities who are athletes. And in fact, I worked when uh, at a sport camp for kids with spina bifida, and everything was extreme athletics. They had uh, a guest every day, including the, the man who climbed the CN Tower in his wheelchair. So it's not always about making it easy. Um, unfortunately, we prioritize and pick the easiest locations to throw ev everything at. And it's not as meaningful. But back to the point about the intrusion on nature. We are intruding on nature and it pisses me off because if we do have to resort to paving or whatever, it's as a woman, I'm sorry if this makes you cringe, but there was a period where you, you got reminded constantly about the fact that sanitary material, do you know how many sanitary pads and tampons are like, and I feel like saying, and like, what do you want me to do about it? You know, until you come up and fix it, you want me to stop bleeding you know, like and I know that there's um there's other but it, you know leave it for, until you have a great solution stop stop haranguing us about that and uh and that's yeah it's like it, the idea of that we are intruding on nature by doing this the the, the uh, rangers have to go in and constantly maintain so the it, it's very reactive and um sorry I kind of went on a bit of a a bit of a tangent there but um but so Basically, in short, that um, not all that we don't have to make everything perfectly flat and easy, but it does have to be maintained and does have to be uh, tested as, as you're doing really well. So thanks. I was just going to say that uh, I think that one thing, too, that people don't 
I always tend to, uh, it's not that I necessarily need a lot of accessible stuff for myself, but I do always find a lot of reasons to have it. Like when you mentioned about putting the wood walkway all the way down the beach, well, I know that that beach is actually pretty deep in some areas, like to walk to the water. So I would also look at it as like, that beach also gets very hot sometimes and walking on that hot sand is really a pain. So being able to have that walkway would have been really super nice to have, not just, yeah. That, and that's, I think that's where a lot of people like when they're like, Oh, you're going to ruin our, our park, but it's like, well, no, <laughs> it, it could be better and, and, and better for everybody, not just people. Yeah. 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 More question. Over here. I'm muted, it's okay. Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, if I could recommend or use your accessibility matrix Absolutely. for the Hill District Board as an education assistant. Mm -hmm. And although we don't go to national parks, um, as you all can perhaps remember, or if you have children, there is a lot of issues with accessibility around the field trips. Mm -hmm. And so how are the children that are mm -hmm. wanting to use parks, mm -hmm. we're finding it, it's becoming a need increasingly difficult situation and I really liked your matrix um, just so that we could have a framework to check off is this somewhere that all of the students that we're going to take can use this particular park like I think it's such a great jumping off point sure. whether it's going up or going down whichever way you're looking at it because I think uh, you know we, we definitely need to be providing it from the youngest to the oldest we're all older sitting here but have kids and we need them to be able to access for whatever reason. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Great. Great points. Are we wrapping up? Yeah. We've done it. Thanks, everybody. That's great comments. I just want to thank you, Tarek, for some very interesting uh, research that you shared with us, and I hope you'll consider coming back and uh, and telling us what, what's coming next. Thanks, everybody. This is really great. <laughs>